So, section 12.1 deals with an overview of gene expression. This is really one of the subjects that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, my PhD thesis studied gene expression in E. coli under anaerobic conditions. That was part of its metabolic strategy. So, of course, I loved metabolism. We talked a lot about cellular respiration. This is also one of those uh, topics which I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in because it, it really is at the forefront of, of what makes us who we are. Here's what I mean by that. Um, we all have, uh, at some point in our life, been a single-celled individual, right? At some point, you were a zygote. And the DNA supplied by the sperm and the egg created a diploid genome, where all of our chromosomes come in pairs. And that particular information originated from our parents. Now, for, for some reason, this is what we're going to explain, that zygote was the basis for all the cells that make up your heart, your skin, your muscles, liver. I mean, I can go on and on, but that original cell led to the production of every cell type you see in your body. Well, wait a second. I only have a diploid genome, I have one co uh, two copies of all the information, how can that information be read so differently? How can that information lead to a heart cell which is involved in contraction and a skin cell that uh, uh, aids in, in protection? And the answer is how the information is read. How are the genes that are contained within that genome expressed? When are they expressed? What levels are they expressed? And it's that differential gene expression that leads to a progenitor cell here becoming all the different cell types of the body. So genes function at the level of traits. You are what you are based on the genes you carry. But even more importantly, genes function at the molecular level. They produce products that shape the cells. And so the two levels, as it says here, are tied together since the, the proteins you express at the molecular level are ultimately going to determine the structure and function of those cells. And those structure, those cells ultimately are going to determine the traits which you carry. So think about it this way. Uh, if I don't express insulin in my pancreatic cells, right, that's one level where that gene is not functioning properly. That ultimately is going to make me diabetic, which is a trait. So one molecular level ultimately leads to an impact on the entire organism. Now, the, the, the understanding of the fact that our chromosomes are packaged into discrete units called genes uh, were, were determined through a series of experiments, of one of which we're going to review here. So Beadle and Tatum uh, worked in the early 40s studying a common bread mold. And what they were looking at is um, the minimum requirements for the growth of this mold uh, are essentially the carbon source. We have to give it something to uh, have uh, grow on. Uh, that's the carbon source, the sugar. Needs inorganic salts, and it needs a cofactor called biotin. And it turns out that these molds have enzymes to synthesize everything else it can need. So the minimum growth requirements. Here's what I need to feed this mold: a carbon source in the form of sugar, inorganic salts, and biotin. All the requirements, proteins, fats, uh, uh, other cofactors, all of that is produced by the enzymes contained within that mold. So now what they did is they created a library of strains that are unable to grow under certain conditions unless supplemented. So let me give you an example. Maybe they had one that, here's the amino acid tyrosine. The mold, normal mold, the wild type mold, was able to produce that amino acid all by itself using specific enzymes. They mutated it to now for organisms that are tyrosine negative. They're unable to produce, uh, or excuse me, unable to produce those amino acids. So you would have to supply it in order to grow. So they're tyrosine negative. So now let's take a look.
So they isolated mutants that required the amino acid arginine to grow. And then they examined the ability of these molds to grow in the presence of various precursors for arginine. And what they ended up doing is uh, separating these organisms based in, uh, on three groups based on their requirements. So if you were able to feed it the first molecule and it was able to grow, that means it had uh, the necessary enzymes, of which there were three, in order to make arginine. So here we have, under minimal media, the normal bacteria were able to grow, but these mutants were not, because at some gene in their pathway was mutated, preventing one of these steps from happening. So then what they did is try to determine where the mutations were for each mutant. So then they supplied it ornithine, which is the second intermediate in the process. This particular mutant, when you feed it ornithine, can ultimately produce the necessary arginine required to grow. So we can see growth here in zone one. What that means then for mutant one is that their enzyme here, the gene for enzyme one, was defective. And if you supply it ornithine, now you overcome the barrier. Now you're able to form citrulline and arginine. So now, next plate, they added citrulline to the plate. They noted that mutant number two was now able to grow. What that means for mutant number two is that it has a, a defect in this enzyme. And when you feed it the third intermediate, then it's able to take it to its logical conclusion, arginine. The third group here can only grow when you supply the arginine itself. So its mutation is here in the third enzyme. So what they concluded is that a single gene controls the synthesis of a single enzyme, which resulted in the formation of the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. The mutation in group number one had an effect on this single gene, preventing the production of that enzyme. And as we went down the row, we can see that the mutant types were uh, categorized based on which gene ultimately was non-functional. So since that work in the 40s, this has been slightly modified only because we know that at the level of quaternary structure, we have multiple protein chains which ultimately contribute to the final function of the protein. And so it's not as if a gene is going to make a fully functional protein. A gene A may uh, code for that uh, peptide chain. Gene B may encode for that peptide chain by themselves, not functional. But in complex now, we have a fully functional protein. And so that's the idea of not necessarily saying one gene, one, uh, one, gene, one enzyme, but let's say one gene, uh, one polypeptide is a better way to say it. So now let's talk about the central dogma of biology. This is essentially the flow of information through a cell. How can a gene produce a protein product? Well, it turns out that we've evolved to have an intermediate molecule here called messenger RNA. And the reason that we've evolved that, there, there are many reasons, one of which I'll talk about is simply based on location. Genes are located in the nucleus. Proteins are translated in the cytoplasm. Right? We know the rough ER, for example, is one place in which proteins are made. So how can we link these very distinct compartments? Well, how about we have an intermediate molecule that is mobile? Let's say in the nucleus, we can produce mRNA through the process of transcription. And that mRNA can exit the nucleus and through the process of translation by ribosomes, ultimately produce proteins. The other thing this allows us to do, in addition to linking distant locations, if we think about it in, in a diploid organism, we have two copies of every gene. Right, one came from dad, one came from mom. So you have two copies. Now, I need that information to be read quickly, and I need to produce lots of protein. Well, if I only have two copies of a textbook, 
and I have 24 students in the class, it's going to take a long time for that information to be disseminated, right? But now if I have 24 textbooks for a class of 24, now each individual can get the information a lot faster. So in this case, by using an intermediate like mRNA, two genes can produce thousands of mRNA molecules. Thousands of mRNA molecules can produce tens of thousands of protein molecules. So we can amplify the information by using an intermediate like mRNA, which we couldn't do if genes produce proteins directly. So in this chapter, we're going to review the many steps of transcription and translation that allow for the propagation of information to occur within an individual cell. Now here's molecular gene expression prokaryotes, molecular gene expression in eukaryotes. The uh, major difference here is no nucleus. And so the process of transcription and translation all can occur at the same time. We don't have to worry about exporting mRNA from a different compartment. But what we have here in the eukaryotic cell is that nucleus. So the transcription step is followed by an RNA processing step, which we'll talk about the importance of. That RNA then must be uh, targeted to the cytoplasm, where ribosomes can now bind, and that protein be targeted along the different pathways we learned about back in Chapter 5. So we talked about genes. We talked about the fact that genes form a polypeptide. Uh, they constitute the genetic material. They determine proper cell function. Now, genes that are called structural genes are the ones that encode for polypeptides. There are other types of genes, though. There are genes that encode for other RNAs, like tRNA or ribosomal RNA or small nuclear RNAs. So there's a whole class of RNAs out there which are encoded by genes that are not structural in nature.